warm welcome. Today's lecture is uh, dedicated in loving memory of Myra Kraft, a dear friend. Today is her yard site, the 20th of July, uh, Yud Chet Tammuz, uh, the third yard site. Myra was a wonderful friend who loved Israel, loved the Jewish people, loved people, was always there to help wherever possible. And I remember now we're in a time of war a number of years ago. We were also under siege. It was a time of war and terrorism. And Myra led a group from Boston, a federation group, and came to Israel to show solidarity, support many programs, including Mayanot. So it is our honor to dedicate today's lecture in loving memory of Myra Kraft. Zichrona Levracha. So it's my honor, and I just want to say that David Horowitz is an outstanding thinker and editor, and when you're back in the States and your heart is still in Israel, check Times of Israel, because that is the number one Israel newspaper. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. This is, uh, thank you for those um, nice words there. And uh, this is kind of uh, um, uncharted territory a bit because you're, first of all, give, I want to know a little bit about you guys. So you're, you're hands up those of you here for the first time. That's a lot of you are not. I'm going to ask that question the other way around. Hands up those of you who have been here before. So that's like mm, kind of half for you maybe. And although lots of people have no hands, should we try it again? Those who've never been here before, you've got to stretch them high in the sky. That area of the room is... Okay, good. And those who have been here before? Okay, so it's about 50, 50, 60, 40 first time. Okay, and when did you get here, all of you, on this trip? Are you, are you like a very quiet, well-behaved group of young people? I see, I understand. Good. So you've been here for a week, okay? And therefore, and you've been, what, all around the country, and you're now nearing the end of the program, correct? Okay, and you're from the United States, and where else? Those of you who are from, not from the United States. Canada, Canada okay? Wonderful country. You can go away for three, six months, you will go back, nothing will have changed, right? <laughs> Just like Israel, uh, not. Okay, where else? America, Canada. That's it? No Brits in the room? From where? Namibia. Namibia. I don't even know where that is, so tell us where that is. Southwest Africa. Okay, was that where? Is Stanley Fisher from Namibia? Aha, the former governor of the Bank of Israel. Where's he from then? Anyone know? Not Zimbabwe, for sure not Zimbabwe, for sure not Rhodesia. I don't think so. You think so? Well, we can look him up afterwards. Okay, if Uri says, then Uri says. Okay, so we've got large representation from the United States. Anyone here from Texas, by the way? Okay, one person from Texas. Where in Texas? Houston. Houston? Okay, so my brother-in-law was the Israeli Consul General in Houston. My wife was born in Dallas, and my daughter is in somewhere in the middle of nowhere, Texas, right now. Bruceville, Texas? At a, at a you know, Jewish camp, something? Anyway, so nothing bad about Texas. Lovely place. It's how I learned your language, speaking to someone from Texas. It's all good. Okay, so America, Canada a bit, really one. Namibia, that's it, right? That's it? Nobody's going to tell me afterwards that they were from Britain and was just too shy to talk about it. Okay, all right, I, I, as you probably gathered, I'm not a native Israeli. I grew up in London. I moved here when I was 20, uh, which means I've been here for 30 years, most of my life now. I've only done journalism. I come from, I think, somewhere in the confused middle ground of Israeli journalism, and therefore the things I'm saying here, certainly from my point of view, will not be to try to steer you to one particular direction. It will be to try and give you a sense of, of what we're grappling with here. Now, I don't know what brought you on this trip, those of you who'd been before and those of you who came for the first time. I don't know what it was that tugged out to your souls and made you decide, I'd really like to go to Israel, or maybe you just thought, hey, free trip to Israel, but I suspect there was probably more to it, okay? You all have your individual stories, right? And we all you're, you're in that stage, by the way, it, it should carry on through your lives if you're intellectually honest with yourselves, of becoming the people that you're going to be in life. And this trip will probably have some impact on it. Uh, you know, we, I, I don't know what kind of impact just yet, but it will have some impact on it. And there was something in your background that made you want to come to Israel. You'll all have variations on for, on, for example, my story. My story is, like I said, I grew up in London, but go back you know, hundreds of years, I've got a 16th century ancestor who's buried have you been to Tiberias yet on this trip? Did you go to where the Rambam, where Maimonides is buried? Probably not. Small cemetery outside, or sort of in Tiberias, where there's only like four or five graves, and one of them is a 16th century ancestor of mine. So I, I discovered growing up, oh, I got like some guy who was you know, very famous and, and uh, uh, halachically uh, um, respected, who was, who was born in Prague, but moved to Israel in the 1600s. More recently, my family were Orthodox, 
German Jews. Any of you of German Jewish background, raise a hand. Okay, so lots of you will have vari variations on this story. Very orthodox, but very German. Sounds bizarre, but actually was you know, pretty normal. My great-grandfather founded an orthodox synagogue in Frankfurt. My grandfather, who was a lawyer, fought for Germany in World War I. That's what you did. If you were a German in Germany in World War I, you fought for Germany. Um, took him a long time, took them a long time to internalize in the 30s that the Nazis were here to stay, that their beloved Germany was going to tolerate the Nazis. And they only left Germany, fled Germany in 1937. And if you're good on World War II history, you'll know that the year later, you had Kristallnacht 38, all the uh, um, synagogues were trashed, including my great-grandfather's synagogue. They'd fled to London by then. And by the end of World War II, my father was old enough to, to be uh, allowed to volunteer to fight in the Royal Air Force. So in the space of a generation, my grandfather actually won medals fighting for Germany in World War I. A generation later, my dad is fighting for the Allies, for the Brits, against Nazi Germany. You grow up in that kind of sort of family background and, and in a period where, as I'm sure has been stated to you sometime on this trip, for the first time in millennia, really, we can speak about a Jewish state, the Jewish people having their homeland, it became quite compelling for me. Also, of course, if you, if you know London at all, any of you been to London? Okay, those of you who've been to London, what? more, more, come on, you're just, you're just like shy people. Okay, did it rain when you were in London? Yeah, okay, that's what it does in London. If it didn't rain in London, you had like a miracle trip to London. So you grew up in London, it rains every day, there's Israel, your ancestor was there, your family had to flee Germany. It became quite compelling for me to come and live in Israel. Add that to the, to that, the journalism thing, right? You live in America. Are people disputing, most of you, Canadians, Namibians, I understand. We'll ask you something in a second. I'm going to pick on you mercilessly for the next half an hour or so. But <laughs> Americans, are your borders in dispute, broadly speaking? Can I, Canada? Is Canada about to invade the United States of America? We don't think so. Does Canada think that the United States of America has no right to exist? Does mighty territory, right? And what about Namibia, by the way? How your, how's your stability? <laughs> That's a big advantage, nobody knowing where you are. I think we'd, that would be good if we could sort of sail Israel out to somewhere where nobody knew where we are. We are a country who, who's, whose physical size is still being determined, that is still agonizing about how to build relations with the neighbors. And, and completely atypically of where you've come from, we're in an incredibly hostile neighborhood, okay? And that's the context, you know, we, we revived this Jewish state, this former national homeland of the Jewish people, right? People get very confused. Why do the Jews have, have, a, have a country of their own? I mean, the Christians don't and the Muslims don't. Well, of course, they do, actually. Lots of Christian-dominated countries, lots of Muslim-dominated countries, only one demographically Jewish-dominated country. This is the only place on earth where the Jewish nation was ever sovereign, right? We never willingly left. We always prayed to return. And eventually, too late to save millions of Jews from the Holocaust, the international community sanctioned the revival of the historic Jewish homeland alongside what was supposed to be the first ever Palestinian state. That's the basis on which this country was revived. We kind of hung together in exile around our religion. That's what kept the Jews going, Judaism. But we didn't have the country, and we got the country back in 1948. However, in an incredibly problematic and nasty region. And what you are, what you have found yourselves plunged into, and it's really been escalating every day since you've been here, right, and which is obviously very troubling for you, and probably 17 times more troubling for people who care about you abroad, because when you're here, you kind of have a sense of the relative degree of craziness, and when you're abroad, you sort of read the worst into everything, so I assume there have been frantic phone calls a lot, okay? You, you are plunged into the current latest round of basically, I would say, in one form or another, uh, a Middle Eastern hostility to the revival of Israel, okay? That's the, 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 the sorry truth. Now, of course, it's incredibly complicated, and, and, I'll, and I'll try not to speak the whole time and try and give you lots of time for questions, but I'll try and sort of sketch out some big picture issues. First of all, in complete contrast to Canada, significant contrast to the United States, and I have no idea about Namibia, this is a really small country. Okay, how does Namibia, how many people live in Namibia? Two million. So we're four times as numerous as Namibia with eight million people. How many people live in Canada? Anyone know how many people live in Canada? Since our Canadian representative does not. 30 million, we think. Might be true, might be not. Sounds good. Okay. How many people live in the United States? This one I know, you should know. 300 plus, right? Okay. Eight million Israelis, 300 million Americans. So much smaller uh, um, num numerically, 
right? How big is this country at its narrowest point? Nine miles wide, okay? The width of Israel at its narrowest point, nine miles. You can drive from the line that used to mark the Jordanian-controlled West Bank on the eastern edge of Israel, right the way across the width of Israel in some points in 15 minutes. Top to bottom, you've done all this. How long did you go to the Golan Heights on this trip? How long was that from Jerusalem? Any guesses? Well, how long was it? Two hours, so your bus driver drove exceptionally fast, even by Israeli standards, but maybe three or four, right? Did you go to Eilat on this trip? You You're going to Eilat tonight? So that's going to take you, what have they told you? Okay, four hours, four and a half hours. That's it. That's the whole length of the country. So sort of eight, nine hours, top to bottom. Like I say, 15 minutes, sterot on the border with Gaza. Did you go there on this trip? Hey guys, you know, there are rockets being fired everywhere, why not? They're out. Okay, we won't get into that. How far do you think it is? If you got into your car now and there was no traffic, how long do you think it would take you to get to the Gaza border? Give me some guesses, there are no... Who said an hour? Okay, well, unfortunately, you're very close to the truth, but I would have wanted somebody to say, like, eight hours. And then I would have said, are you crazy? It's about an hour, okay? It's about an hour, it's about an hour and 15 minutes. And people don't realize that. People think, wait a minute, that's the edge of Israel. You must have to get onto an airplane and then drive for a while, and then finally you'd get to steroids. It's an hour and 15 minutes from Jerusalem. However, in terms of emphasizing the drama of our reality, it became slightly less relevant in the last few days because the rockets, of course, that Hamas is firing, something like 1,500 in the last two weeks or so, have not been uh, um, solely uh, targeting southern Israel. The, the band, as you know, of, of the range of, that these rockets can travel, which, which we knew before, and in the last round of conflict about 20 months ago, there were rockets fired at Tel Aviv and at Jerusalem, but just one or two. And in this conflict, we've seen lots of rockets fired deep into central Israel and even beyond, even into the northern parts of Israel. This is a new experience for all of us, and therefore the centrality of Sterot in describing our conflict with, with, with Hamas actually has receded a little bit, because most of Israel is under attack. In fact, the conflict that we are in at the moment is it's moving all the time in terms of its essential contours. So, for example, in the last few days that you've been here, you've been very conscious of rocket attacks uh, uh, in Israel, and that's what people have been worrying about, and we have this extraordinary system of alarms, bomb shelters, apps, sirens, and you know, most, most astoundingly, we have a, a rocket defense system, a missile defense system, unique around the world, developed with American funding, so you can feel good about that, and Israeli brain power, Jewish brain power, so you can feel good about that, uh, which, which, you know, talk about sort of looking for a needle in a haystack. Iron Dome is basically, it's plucking needles out of the sky. Uh, we ran a piece on our, on our website um, on the Time of Israel a few days ago where one of the developers behind Iron Dome said, sort of imagine a very large Coca-Cola bottle wobbling, traveling, I think, four times the speed of sound on a uh, non-direct path coming right at you. And that's what Iron Dome is taking out in, by the hundreds, which is, these are numbers that we just haven't talked about before. 1,500 rockets or so fired at Israel and hundreds of intercepts. Does that mean, if I'm talking about two, 300 intercepts, that Iron Dome only succeeds in intercepting one in five of these rockets and therefore we should be panicking more? No, it's so sophisticated that it is only dispatched, that the intercept is only used when the computer calculates that the rocket is heading into some uh, uh, residential area. So in uh, um, a large proportion, I don't, I don't want to uh, um, attempt to assess the number, but in a large proportion, the, the, the incoming rockets are tracked. It's clear that they're not going to hit uh, areas where people are uh, likely to be affected. We don't fire the intercept. When the computer tracks that it's heading into a residential area, then the iron dome goes up, and from what we can tell, is successful about 90% of the time. So in other words, of the rockets that it is launched to intercept, this incredible missile defense system, this, this umbrella, if you like, uh, this Iron Dome, which is a very smart name for it, it's taking out nine out of the 10 rockets. Now that's, it's very good, obviously, because there'd be massively more de devastation in Israel and masses of loss of, of loss of life. It's a bit worrying in terms of the, I would say the speed with which all of us, I don't know if this extends to you, um, how, how, you know, when there's, you've been in siren areas on this trip? Or well, you've not been. Okay, so if you were in a siren area, since it's you know your first times, I assume you take it very seriously. As Israelis have come to rely increasingly on Iron Dome, you worry that they're becoming too reliant on it, and therefore a little bit lackadaisical. We haven't really seen that. Okay, there have been very few. I think there have been, as far as I can tell, there was one Israeli killed yesterday. 
uh, as a direct result of a rocket attack. There was an Israeli killed by mortar fire who was very close to the Gaza border. There were two people who died, elderly people, who died of heart attacks when sirens rang out. And that's been the extent of the direct Israeli fatalities or indirect Israeli fatalities and direct as a consequence of the rocket attacks. And you kind of worry that people will become lackadaisical and over, overly reliant, which I, I, I don't think is the case yet. And you also, s you, you, you become aware, and now we're really getting into to some of the sensitivities of this conflict, that the fact that lots of Israelis are not dying, despite Hamas's best efforts to kill us, is very good for us as human beings, and really bad for Israel in terms of the way the international community looks at this conflict. Okay, because what's happening here is basically, and this happens all the time, and it's not, it's not surprising anymore, but it's outrageous and incredibly frustrating nonetheless, is that people looking at this conflict and reporting on this conflict look only at the, the, the numbers game, the death toll, and they look and they see only you know, half a dozen Israeli civilians and unfortunately, terribly actually, a growing number of Israeli soldiers who are being killed and 300 plus Palestinians who are being killed in Gaza. And if you just look at those bald numbers like that, well, that just must mean that Israel is overreacting and using disproportionate force against Gaza. Now, among the many, many reasons why that's just not true, and not only not true, it's intellectually so dishonest and it's so manipulated and cynically abused, among the reasons are, first of all, that we protect our people. We are trying not to have our people killed, hence the massive technological investment in a missile defense system against a terrorist organization that took over Gaza, killing Palestinians in 2007, and has devoted all of its resources to trying to kill Israelis while conducting that warfare from the middle of Gaza's population centers. So it's trying, however, counterintuitive this may be, it is both trying to kill Israelis, and I would argue Hamas, is also actually cynically entirely content, and remember it killed Palestinians when taking power, entirely content to see Palestinians being killed all around it as Israel tries to stop the attacks on Israel. And that's what's happening. We're trying to minimize their civilian fatalities as they are using Gazans as human shields from among whom to fire on Israel. That's a really complicated conflict that we're in, but it's not impossibly complicated. It requires a bit of intellectual effort. The fact that Israelis are not dying in larger numbers is one of the reasons why this conflict is being, I would say, misrepresented. And therefore, not only are we trying to keep this country safe, not only are we trying to stop Hamas firing rockets into Israel, and as I said, this conflict is transforming a bit, and therefore in the last few days, we've been obsessed with trying to stop Hamas using the tunnels that it has dug under the border to get into Israel and kill Israeli civilians and soldiers. We're also trying, having to try to explain why, even though we're doing our best to minimize their fatalities, actually people are dying in Gaza because of the way that Hamas is fighting. So it's a complicated conflict that we're in the midst of, like I say, in an incredibly problematic wider region. So just to take a step back and look at the sort of problematics of the wider region, we're this tiny country on the western edge of a, a fairly hostile landmass that has been trying to reach good relations with the neighbors. Okay, when we were established in 1948, re-established in the Declaration of Independence, it states that we stretch out our hand for good relations with the neighbors. That is Israel's genuine desire. Unfortunately, the state was established in 48 in the midst of a war designed to destroy it before we had even begun to sort of exist. The 1948 War of Independence, which Israel survived. In 67, the Six Day War, we preempted a, 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 an Arab attempt to mount a comprehensive war intended to destroy Israel, and we prevailed in six days. 73, we were attacked on Yom Kippur, that's why it's called the Yom Kippur War, when Israel was pretty unprepared and pretty confident after 67 that no one would dare attack us. So we've had this series of conventional wars that we survived. We had a decade ago the Second Intifada, which was basically a war of suicide bombings. Suicide bombers sent into Israel and blown up the buses and restaurants and shopping malls, as I'm sure you are well aware. And now we're into a new era of efforts to wipe us out, which is missile attacks all over Israel and an effort internationally to delegitimize us. It's, it's, it's a pretty problematic neighborhood, as I said. When we've been able to, I would say, we've tried to make peace with the neighbors. So for example, at the end of the 1970s, 
after Egypt had failed to wipe Israel out in the 73 war, President Sadat of Egypt kind of flew to Israel out of the blue and spoke in the Knesset in the Israeli parliament and said, let's put an end to the wars between us. Now, I don't know how good you are on Israeli history. Do you know the prime minister was in Israel in 77, 78, end of the 70s when Sadat came to Israel? If somebody said the right thing there quietly. Who was that? Ah, yeah, Menachem Begin, right? Menachem Begin was a Holocaust scarred, right wing, skeptical about the Arabs, Israeli prime minister. And yet, when Sadat came to Israel and spoke in the Knesset and said, let's put an end to the wars between us, of course, Begin engaged with Sadat. And at the end of the 70s, we made peace with Egypt, the most important Arab state even more important then than it was now, because there was a credible leader who Israel thought was serious about making peace. Who else have we got peace treaties with? Anybody? Jordan. Okay, Jordan. When, who was that? Rabin. That was Prime Minister Rabin, 1994, when for the first time, King Hussein of Jordan, who'd been actually quietly quite friendly to Israel, publicly met with Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in the summer of 1994. How long did it take us from that first meeting until we signed a peace treaty? About three months. In other words, quite a complicated treaty. Nonetheless, as soon as there was a credible overture, Israel made peace. Our problematics with the Syrians and the Palestinians, and believe me, we've got problems further afield as well as Iran closes in on the bomb, are really complicated. And therefore, if in the course of this trip, and I want to come back to what I said before about really not trying to steer you in terms of Israeli politics, in the course of this trip, if you come to the conclusion that you really have got it, that on the Palestinian front, most especially, you know who the good guys are, you know who the bad guys are. Obviously, Israel should do this. Obviously, Israel should, shouldn't do that. If you, if you reach some kind of clear-cut sense somewhere in the course of this trip, all I can urge you to do is, you know, savor it, enjoy it, because it is, of course, entirely delusional, and it will pass, right? You understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is that the deeper you begin to internalize the complexities of our conflict with the Palestinians, the harder it is, if you're honest with yourself, to come to clear-cut conclusions. So, for example, in Israel right now, there's pretty much a wall-to-wall -wall consensus that with Hamas, this is impossible. Here you have an Islamic extremist organization that preaches not live and let live, but kill and be killed, that tells its people that if you kill Jews, Christians, and quote-unquote non-believing Muslims and die yourself, you'll be guaranteed entry to paradise. That's the only guarantee to paradise. Now, that sounds absurd and ridiculous, but Americans on, on, in the wake of 9-11, I think, are, are, are better equipped than many people to believe, to reject that sort of instinctive humanity, to, to, to believe that Islamic extremism rejects that kind of instinctive humanity, to internalize that. That's what we're up against with Hamas, an organization committed to destroying Israel, telling its people that they're doing God's work in killing us and getting killed themselves. So if you want a sense of sort of the Israeli consensus about Hamas, it's that, you know, we could try to negotiate with these people until we're blue in the face. It's not going to get us anywhere. They're committed to our destruction. And what, you're, you're, what we're grappling with now in Israel is we, we, we feel that we were forced into this conflict with Hamas. And the question is, how big is this conflict going to become? Are we going to retake the Gaza Strip, where Hamas took power in 2000, 2007, and where Israel left in 2005. We have no military presence in Gaza before this conflict. We have no civilian presence in Gaza. Are we going to go back in for the long term, or can we, co can we stop this conflict without reconquering Gaza and still have some guarantee that the rockets and the tunnels won't restart again five minutes later? That's what we're grappling with where Hamas is concerned. Hamas is not the only uh, um, component of the Palestinian leadership. The other component is Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority who were kicked out of Gaza in 2007 but who are still in control of most of the West Bank. And there in Israel you have no consensus whatsoever. Within Israel you have people saying Mahmoud Abbas is just as bad as Hamas or nearly as bad as Hamas and really just wants to destroy Israel in phases. You have people who say what are you talking about? Mahmoud Abbas is our last best hope of a relatively moderate Palestinian leader. You have people who are saying we should have worked much more closely with Mahmoud Abbas. Maybe there was better progress we could have, been ma we could have made at the diplomatic table. And people who are saying are you crazy? We tried everything. The previous Prime Minister, Mr. Olmert, offered the Palestinians everything that they say they want and Abbas wouldn't do a deal and these are very broad brushstrokes that I'm giving you but we're very conflicted and our, our complexity is exacerbated by what's been happening in the wider Middle East over the last few years which is in short 
chaos, right? Everywhere you look in the Middle East, unpredictability and instability. And anybody who tells you what they think is going to happen next in the Middle East, you know, you can be polite and then not take very much notice. Nobody knows how any things are going to play out. The only thing we can be fairly confident about is that things will remain unpredictable and unstable. Syria, for example, to our north, right? You were in the Golan. What did they tell you? you, you how, did they tell you how far you were from Damascus? Anybody? Did they talk about it? It's like an hour, am I right, Uri? About an hour from Damascus? You, but you saw the significance of the territory, right? You saw that you were high, and therefore you, were, you can look over towards Syria, and if Syria controlled the Golan, they would be looking over at northern Israel. Well, it might shock you if they didn't say this to you, that four or five years ago, Israel's security chiefs were saying to the politicians, maybe you should try and make peace with Syria, even at the price of relinquishing the Golan, because that will give us stability on the Syrian border, and by extension, stability on the, on the Lebanese border, and it will isolate Syria's best ally in this region, which is Iran. So the security chiefs, not politicians, people whose job it is to keep this country safe, as recently as five years ago, were saying to the politicians, we can afford to take the risk of relinquishing the Golan Heights. And if you, if you think about that today from the perspective of 2014, with civil war in Syria and 160,000 people dead, and who knows what is going to play out in Syria, that sounds ridiculous. How could Israel possibly give up the high ground? And that fast pace of history, if you like, underlines the complexities of our dilemmas with the Syrians, with the Palestinians. We thought it would be safe to relinquish the Golan. The security chiefs thought it would be safe to relinquish the Golan as recently as five years ago. Now nobody would say that. We're being pushed, pull out of all or most of the West Bank. Well, Netanyahu just a few days ago said, you know, I want to find an accommodation with the Palestinians, but I worry that if we relinquish security control, he said, in the West Bank, in Abbas's area, between Israel and Jordan, it will be exploited by people more extreme than Abbas. Hamas might take over there, then we'll have rockets flying over that border, tunnels coming under that border, and he said the West Bank is 20 times the size of Gaza. So it's not so straightforward. Again, I'm, I'm honestly, however much this may not sound to be the case, I'm not trying to steer you to one direction or another because there's a big argument in Israel that says we should have cut the deal with Abbas, that we should have not expanded Israeli settlement projects in the West Bank, that at the very least we shouldn't build settlements in areas that we don't think we would want to retain in the West Bank, that we could have done more with Abbas, and there are lots of Israelis, like I say, who think you know, we tried pretty seriously with Abbas. I'm just trying to underline to you some of the complexities of the challenges that we face. But I would draw a pretty strong contrast between Mahmoud Abbas and the relatively moderate Palestinian leadership, who at least overtly do not talk about a desire to wipe out Israel, and Hamas in Gaza, and capable of taking over the West Bank, we, we worry, who are most avowedly committed to destroying Israel, and then are supported by most especially, I would say, Iran, closing in on a, nucle on a nuclear weapon, incredibly hostile to Israel, every other day talking about its desire to see the elimination of Israel. So this is a pretty hairy area. Okay, a, a few more things I want to say, and then I want to I give you time to ask me questions, because I fear that I'm bombarding you with, uh, with too much information. Because your trip probably has been ca carried out you know, with this conflict very center stage, don't lose sight of some of the amazing things about this country, okay? This is an amazing country from, from many, many perspectives. Amazing simply in terms of it being viable for people to live in. Much of the land that is today's Israel was malarial 150 years ago. You actually couldn't physically live there, you'd die, right? So we cleaned out the swamps. We made this country habitable. That's an astounding thing. We revived a language, and I don't think there's any historical precedent for that. Nobody was speaking Hebrew 150 years ago as a language of conversation, and now 8 million Israelis are speaking it, and plenty of people around the world are speaking it. We dragged this ancient language into the modern era, and you have this incredible academy of Israeli linguistic experts coining new words in modern Hebrew for things that just didn't exist. You know, last time anybody was speaking Hebrew, for words, for concepts, that, you know, bringing Hebrew back into... Uh, um, capable uh, uh, um, modern usage. Astounding thing. Okay, this is a country with an incredible amount of brain power. I mean, this is meant to be the promised land. Not so good on, on raw materials, right? This is not an oil-rich kingdom, although we have oil shale 
buried under Israeli territory, and we're kind of conflicted about can we get it out safely without physically destroying the country. At the moment, we're not doing any sort of dramatic fracking, if that's of interest to anybody at the moment. Not so good on the natural resources, though we found a bit of natural gas off the coast lately, which is helping us uh, uh, resource-wise, but very good on, on one natural resource, which is brain power. And therefore, you've had like a dozen Israeli Nobel Prizes, which is just staggeringly disproportionate, including five or six for chemistry in the last decade. And why do I say five or six? Not because I'm not sure, but because one of the six was kind of Israeli, but he's really Californian now, so we kind of sort of half consider it to be an Israeli Nobel Prize. We have this incredible army unit run by a guy whose father, who's only here because his father jumped off the train to Auschwitz, which sits bags packed, ready to go to any humanitarian crisis zone anywhere in the world. Israel to Haiti, 60 now flight. Who were the first people in Haiti with a working field hospital? Well, that would be Israel. Right, the Philippines, even uh, uh, New Jersey, as far as I know, there were Israelis getting involved. Turkey. Right now, even as we're fighting Hamas in Gaza, we've set up a field hospital, just announced as I was coming in to speak to this group, uh, just set up on the Gaza border to try and help treat Gazan casualties of a war we are being drawn into fighting and in which we are, to our dismay, killing Gazans who are placed in harm's way by Hamas firing on us. We've just set up a field hospital, or we're about to, on the Gaza border. So we're really, you know, cool on the, on the humanitarian outreach stuff, including technologically. So when Obama was here last year, they showed him this little snake, for example, this remote control snake, that in its tiniest uh, uh, versions can be used in surgery, and in its larger versions goes into sort of earthquake struck or disaster hit buildings, areas where even dogs couldn't get in, and can find signs of life and so on. Incredible stuff. So all, all sorts of technological breakthroughs. And as a, as a country, we shifted really from the, the land of Jaffa oranges and agriculture to this high-tech country with more startups than pretty much any other country apart from the US on NASDAQ and so on. So big, big on brain power, transition to a high-tech economy. Very, very cool. So don't lose track of, of the, of the uh, energy and positive aspects to this country. I'm sure you've sort of internalized a lot of, of what is remarkable about Israel, the more remarkable, I think, because of the region in which we are. Can you imagine how Israel would thrive if we weren't preoccupied so much of the time with the simple business of trying to keep this country safe? Okay, those are the sort of big picture things that I wanted to say to you, but now ask me stuff, and ask me stuff that I didn't touch upon, stuff that's troubling you, uh, you know, this is a good opportunity, go for it. Don't be polite, don't be bashful, and don't be afraid of asking something that sounds silly. Sometimes the naive questions are, you know, for sure the smartest. Yeah. What about like what happened um, Thanks, yesterday, yeah. I think it was yesterday, where um, it was like the Bedouin area, where the place that got hit, they are Israeli, right, but they're not kind of like the Iron Dome. So okay, so this is Israel, right? So the, 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 I'll repeat the question by all means. So the outspoken single representative of Canada um, asked what happened yesterday where a Bedouin father and I think a three month, he was killed and I think his three month old daughter was very badly hurt. They don't have bomb shelters or protected areas. They're Bedouin, right? Their lifestyle is to live in tents in the middle of nowhere, right? So the sirens, I think, uh, it's not clear to me that sirens work in all areas, but even if they hear the sirens, where are they supposed to go? Okay, so you know, this being Israel was, was what I started to say. There are, they have already, even before yesterday, there were uh, um, activist groups that were saying to the government, what are you going to do about the Bedouin, for goodness sake? Well, I understand that the scale of the rocket threat is greater in the last few days than it has ever been before. And therefore, at the same time as Israel has done a great deal to try and protect its people, it obviously hasn't done everything. And one of the areas where it has had not taken sufficient means was in protecting people who live out in the open. I don't know how they're going to grapple with it, but I can tell you that people are already pushing for, we've well, got to find some kind of solution. What are you going to do, right? Does that mean you, you're going to force these people to relocate into built-up areas, which, by the way, Israel in many cases would want lots of the Bedouin to do because there are all kinds of territorial disputes with the Bedouin. But in terms of their own safety, we would certainly want them to. They probably really wouldn't want to, right, because they are nomadic people who want to live out on the land. So I don't know how it's going to be resolved, but I can tell you that people are anguished by it and trying to deal with it because it's not okay. Here was a guy who was killed because I even if, I mean, any of us can be out of the open and the chances are pretty small that you're going to be hit, right? If you, you, know, you lie down and you, you, you get your angles right and try to protect yourself as best you can, it's incredibly unfortunate that he was killed. Nonetheless, people are trying to find a solution to that as far as I know. Other stuff. 
Yeah. Just speak a little louder. Oh, okay. I just want to clarify something I heard. Somebody said there was something about um, Palestinian snipers. Is this accurate, or was that like a rumor? Um, I don't know. I haven't heard of a specific case of Palestinian snipers, as in sort of standing on high borders on the other side of, a, of uh, high buildings on the other side of a border and aiming at Israeli civilians. But again, this this is a conflict that that is moving. And whereas a few days ago we were preoccupied with the rockets, in the last few days it has <coughs> dawned on most Israelis, although the army knew this before that the tunnel threat from Gaza is, is acute. And that means, in some cases, incredibly sophisticated tunnels built by Hamas running as, as long as a mile and as deep as, well, you know, buildings deep, you know, 60 feet deep, maybe even more, I've heard, right? Where they've tunneled under the border and two of the soldiers who were killed yesterday were killed when a Hamas gang, terror cell, emerged into southern Israel and probably were planning to go to a nearby kibbutz, I think, and try and kill lots of people. But in fact, an Israeli army patrol happened to be in that area, as far as I understand. And the Hamas guys opened fire, including with anti-tank uh, um, uh, missiles, on this Israeli jeep, and they killed two soldiers. So that's, you know, Hamas gunmen targeting people in Israel at the border through tunnels. You know, that, that is a threat that Israel's trying to counter. Snipers who are sort of looking over, you know, that, that gives us a sense of on high ground firing into Israel. I've not heard any talk about that. Um, confronting Israeli troops in Gaza, I'm sure they're doing everything that they possibly can to try and kill Israeli troops in Gaza. But a threat within Israel, not that I know of. Okay? Yeah. Okay, I want to repeat the question because what I said about questions that maybe sound a bit naive being the smartest questions, your question didn't sound naive, but it's a great big question. It's a really important question. What do I think, how do I think this conflict's going to end, right? Is it going to bring peace? Is it just going to give us a couple of years before the next flare up with Hamas? You know, how are things going to change? Okay, so the first thing is I want to redirect you to what I said before about the impossibility of predicting stuff, okay? Because it's just impossible. In the, in the very specific case of, of resorts to major conflict, if you look at history, you'll see that it's, it's not hard um, to, to, to know the goals sometimes of conflicts when they erupt, but they, they change shape and they expand and the unpredictable sort of constantly happens. And therefore knowing where this conflict is going, even if you, you think you know what the leaderships had in mind, I think is an impossible task. So for example, I think we can be a bit smart looking back, okay? We can say, how did this conflict flare up? Well, it flared up, you know, a long sequence of events, including the kidnapping and killing of three Israeli teenagers in the West Bank on June the 12th. Uh, uh, an Israeli extremist terrorist Jewish group, I would say, exacting quote-unquote revenge by grabbing a 16-year-old Palestinian in East Jerusalem and killing him. Rocket fire on Israel, limited Israeli responses, and, and a great effort by Israel to say to Hamas, we don't want to get drawn into another round of conflict with you. If you shut up, we'll shut up. And clearly, and I'm saying this, I think any fair-minded objective observer would say, clearly this is a conflict that Israel tried to avoid and that Hamas wanted. And Hamas last Tuesday rejected is Egyptian ceasefire terms, which, were, which it deemed unacceptable, and is making demands that would basically entrench it as a terrorist rule in Gaza. It's making those demands uh, and, and others uh, um, um, for a ceasefire, and therefore we have a conflict that I think Israel does not, has not wanted to see, to see expanding, and that Hamas has wanted to see expanding, and therefore it becomes very hard to answer your question, and I'll, j I'll tell you, I just, before I came here, I just wrote a piece that we just posted on the site, which I think I headlined um, the looming invasion of Gaza, because it seems to me that Netanyahu's goal for this conflict has been the very reasonable, necessary, goal of restoring sustained peace and security for Israeli civilians, right? Well, I don't see how, how he achieves that easily, given that Hamas doesn't want to give Israel uh, security and sustained calm, um, and therefore I don't think it is about to stop fighting, especially as it's drawing Israel deeper into Gaza and killing increasing numbers of Israeli soldiers. It's continuing to be able to fire rockets, and because it's built this whole underground system in Gaza, its leadership and much of its 
terrorist capacity, its rocket fire, its, its, its armed men, seem to me to be largely intact. And therefore, I'd love to be wrong, actually, because you know, I think all of us would like to see innocent people not being threatened or killed, right? So from that point of view, you'd want this to end. I don't see it ending in the, in the near future. And it was very interesting. Um, on Friday night, Tippi Livni, who is the most dovish, moderate, if you like, um, when it, remember when I talked to you about the sort of different Israeli takes on, on whether Mr. Abbas is a, is a credible player or not? So she's been the most supportive of trying to make progress with Abbas. She, on Friday night, was asked on television, you know, it was kind of a throwaway question. Well, obviously, the, the goal here isn't to bring down Hamas in Gaza. And she said, I wouldn't take any options off the table. And they almost fell out of their chairs, right? Because here's, this isn't sort of Netanyahu somewhere in the center right of the political spectrum. This is, this is Livni in the center left, sounding very, very tough. Her point being, this kind of depends on Hamas. If, if, they're, if they're not prepared to, to agree to terms that guarantee calm and, and security for all of us in Israel, then she's saying, I'm not, I'm not telling them what the limitations might be on this Israeli resort to force. The short answer to your question, therefore, is I don't know. Okay, but I know that wasn't a very, the long answer was not particularly upbeat because that's the way it seems right now. Yeah. Um, potential moderate to, to dovish government. Okay, so the question was, you know, given that, what did you say, that Hamas is what? S um, sort of Pretty entrenched. Yeah. Is it better for Israel to have a hawkish, tougher government or a moderate, um, more mo a more moderate government? First of all, I think in, in, in this conflict, the, the realization of what Israel is up against, which is that a terrorist organization came to power in Gaza and is hell-bent on destroying Israel as a long-term goal and strengthening in Gaza in the interim has meant that pretty much the entire Israeli political spectrum, except um, on the far left, I guess, there's, there's more of a belief that this could have been avoided and Israel is acting uh, um, uh, unacceptably. And on the far right, I think there was probably an earlier uh, uh, and more hawkish demand Broadly speaking, so m even not just middle ground, so beyond middle ground, uh, Israel is pretty much in one place. And, and like I say, when you have the most dovish member of the cabinet saying, well, all options are on the table, when you have the Labour Party, which is the opposition relatively moderate party, sounding you know, very supportive and, and somewhat worried, you know, the government is, is, I would say, and because Netanyahu held back didn't launch the ground offensive for, for 10 days, accepted the Egyptian ceasefire terms and so on. Um, there's a fair amount of unity. Now, again, without wanting to predict stuff, m most Israelis, I think, felt there was an inevitability for the use of ground forces. And this, this sounds like a theoretical thing, ground forces, right? Well, you're in an Israel, which I hope you've internalized, is a tiny little country with only 8 million people and therefore with quite a small standing army. So when you say sending in the ground forces, that means sending in everybody's kit, right? And therefore, on the one hand, there was a realization that, well, maybe this is inevitable. On the other hand, if, when casualty figures mount, this is not some kind of professional army that doesn't touch people's lives whose job it is to go to war. This is our kids during their three-year stint of protecting the country or their pa our, our, our cousins and our brothers and our parents still doing reserve duty in there. One of the guys killed yesterday was 45 years old, right? He was a reservist. He went back down to Gaza to, to command his troops and he was killed. And therefore, the sensitivity in Israel to a mounting death toll, not just among civilians, but among soldiers, is so acute that if and when this gets stickier and nastier, you, you will start to hear people saying, well, maybe we should have done this differently. And blah, blah, blah. But broadly speaking, I think the, the obviousness of Hamas's awfulness is quite a unifying factor for Israel now. Okay? Yeah. And also, how you keep neutral, like, you sound like an advocate for Israel, but how do you be an advocate at the same time trying to appear neutral? Even terms like fighters rather than terrorists when referring to Hamas, things like that. What's the last thing you said, even in terms of? Like your use of, the, of like terminology like fighters, and Hamas, terrorists, fighters okay. rather than terrorists. Sure. Okay, well, first of all, it's not an exact science. The question, for those of you who didn't hear it, 
was, was my planted question, for which I will give you your 10% later, about how come the Times of Israel is, you know, how, what's it like doing the Times of Israel? But it's a very serious question. First of all, the site is only two and a half years old, um, and therefore it's, you know, it's, uh, well, I think, I, I imagine that all journalism now is evolving all the time anyway, but the site is a fairly new site, which has meant that a lot of the people who work on the site, I'm really, really old compared to just about everybody who works at the Times of Israel, which was a you know, staggering realization to me not long ago, because I used to think I was really quite young, and in fact, of course, my children are your age. I didn't even ask you yet. How old are you guys? Ish. Mid-20s? Okay, so my children are getting on for your age, and the younger ones among you. My eldest, is, my eldest who, who is in, is, who's in the army right now, is 22, for example. So it's quite a young team that we're working with, and therefore it's really a challenge. Add to that that the whole imperative, the reason that I set it up, was to try and report Israel and the Jewish world fairly and without attachment to this or that Israeli political direction. Uh, but also to do honest journalism in terms of what, what anyone internationally who has decent standards would, would consider honest journalism. To report things as fairly as, as, we, as we can and to give a blog platform for a range of, of, of opinions across the spectrum. So at, at times of conflict slash mini war, those imperatives remain the same. It's just, it's just more intense. So we are actually live blogging this conflict, which means we have people who are just feeding material into a sort of live blog of sirens wailing, somebody saying something, uh, uh, this happened in Gaza, uh, this video was posted, etc., etc., which you'll see if you, if you go to the site, as well as trying to publish coherent news, news stories of, of longer lasting value and maintaining the other aspects of the site. So, you know, it's, it's a constant challenge, more so in times of particular intensity, in terms of what, what I said before, it not being an exact science. So, for example, we agonize about terminology. We tend to call settlements settlements. We tend to call the West Bank the West Bank rather than the biblical Judea and Samaria. When people say Judea and Samaria, we don't stop them saying it. We, that's the biblical terms for the, uh, uh, for the West Bank. You know, those are choices we made. Um, people get very upset, some of them. You, should be, you shouldn't be calling them settlements. You should be calling them communities. Well, they're in territory that Israel hasn't claimed as being part of our sovereign country, and therefore we use that terminology. Terrorists or gunmen or fighters you know, when, when somebody is targeting civilians, it seems to me, that is terrorism. When they're, when they're fighting in somebody else's sovereign country, that seems to me to, to meet the definition of terrorism. Confronting the Israeli army in non-sovereign, non-Israeli sovereign Gaza, we, we haven't used the word terrorism. And that's where we've drawn that particular semantic line in the realization that these semantics are incredibly important. I mean, they're very significant. I'll give you another huge challenge for us, the issue of, of figures of the dead, right? Which I, whose centrality to, to, in my opinion, understanding and misunderstanding this conflict, conflict is really a big deal. We know how many people are being killed or injured in Israel. The only evidence we have for, for the numbers uh, dead and injured in Gaza, the only uh, um, hard, factual, numerical information comes from the Gaza Health Ministry, which is controlled by Hamas. Israel does not keep track of fatalities of Palestinians in Gaza. That's incredibly problematic. And it's something that I, for example, for years, have begged official Israel to, to internalize. Because, for example, at the end of um, Pillar of Defense, which was the last, no, sorry, the end of Cast Lead, which was the round of conflict before this one, six be before the one before this one, we had Cast Lead at the end of 2008, we had Pillar of Defense 20 months ago, and now we have what is called Protective Edge. After Cast Lead, I met with the one Israeli soldier whose job it was to compile information on Palestinian dead. He was stationed at Erez, at the crossing point between Israel and Gaza, and weeks after that conflict, for which Israel was castigated internationally, including by the UN and the not notorious Goldstone report and so on, and, and during which Israel gave no figures of Palestinian fatalities. Weeks afterwards, this guy comes out with a whole file of everybody who'd been killed in Gaza, as far as he could ascertain, using, among other things, Hamas's own websites, and finding that medics, quote-unquote, who were killed by Israel, turned out to be known armed members of Hamas and so on. And I said to the army before then and since many times, if, if Israel wants this conflict to be better understood and there'll be further rounds of conflict, they, the, the army has to expend more resources keeping track of what exactly is going on in Gaza. Hasn't happened yet, and that makes that aspect of, of what we and everybody else reports particularly problematic. So we're trying where we quote Gaza fatalities to say according to Palestinian sources. But 
You know, I don't have a counter number or a, or a credible number of our own because Israel has no credible numbers of its own. That's just, those are some of the complexities. Yeah. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Given the problem that it's, it's impossible to, to negotiate with people who are irrational, how do you solve this? The worst thing that I can say is I don't think that they're irrational. And that's from their point. They're, they might be irrational from our point of view in that they are entirely callous to the notion of getting their own people killed in order to harm Israel. Musa Abu Marzouk, who is the number two in the Hamas quote-unquote political leadership, said to Abbas last week when Abbas was trying to push a ceasefire, what are 200 martyrs in Gaza in order to lift the siege? In other words, we don't care if lots of people get killed in Gaza, if it means that Israel and Egypt stop preventing material getting into the Strip. And by material, of course, Hamas will abuse any potential to bring in material to bring in weapons and redouble its strength in Gaza and its capacity to harm Israel. So I don't, I don't think that they're irrational. They're rational from their perverted point of view, which is this belief, this asserted belief, that it is their holy obligation to kill and be killed, to kill Jews, Christians, non-believing Muslims, and be killed in the process. When you're grappling, it's, you're asking, it's the same question. I'm just re, sort of rephrasing the question. It's, it's too, you're being too nice to them in a way to say irrational. There's a, there's a devilish, evil rationality to what they're doing. And that brings me back to the answer I gave your, 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 your friend here about how this plays out. The, the problematics that I see is that everyone's talking about what Hamas's ceasefire demands. Israel's ceasefire demand is sustained security for its people. They're not going to give us that unless or until they feel that the consequences for them of carrying on become untenable. And I don't know when that line is reached short of Israel reinvading Gaza. And I don't know that I'm right about that, but that's the way it seems to me. We'll do, we'll do two more questions. So, yeah. Lady in the corner. So how, how does Israel successfully weaken Hamas? Militarily? Non-military. So what are, what are you thinking of? Politically? Well, <laughs> That's a really difficult question, okay? That's a spectacularly difficult question. It was just a few words and it was really hard. How does Israel weaken Hamas? And you're not talking about militarily. So militarily, you know what Israel's trying to do. Politically, in, in, the, in parts of the Arab world, there is some horror at the cynicism of Hamas in, in fighting Israel from within Gaza's civilian areas and therefore bringing havoc down upon Gaza. Unfortunately, in other parts of the Arab world and too much of the international community, there is either sort of willful blindness to what is going on or a hostility to Israel that in many cases is felt by people who don't think this country should exist at all and who capitalize on any uh, defensive war forced on Israel to batter Israel. So how do you fight that? Well, among other reasons, you know, you have people who are relatively articulate trying to explain things as effectively as they can. You try when rockets are not flying ideally to bring as many people as you can to Israel because once you come to Israel you know there may be some of you who, who leave this visit saying that country's just uh, you know crazy and I don't even like it but I suspect lots of you will leave this, leave, leave this trip saying that's just an astounding little country I'm so glad I saw it for myself I'm better able to explain it to other people now I think the more time you spend in Israel even by the way if you also spent lots of time if and when it's safe in the West Bank and Gaza. I think the more you know, the more you empathize with the challenges that this country's facing. So, you know, bringing people here, and when you can't bring them here, explaining by whatever means necessary. We live in a world of, you know, social media and Facebook and Twitter and so on. You know, face-to-face -face is always better. Face-to-face -face in situ, you know, in the place is always better. But it's a hard struggle, and it's a hard struggle, especially in an international climate where there is so much ignorance and where it's really discomforting, I'll add one point here, right? If you're a, a Jew in, you know, America's a little different because America's knee-jerk mindset understands some of the challenges that we're going through, in part because of 9-11, in part because, because of the particular relationship between Israel and the United States. In Europe, where there, are, where there are larger Muslim populations than Jewish populations almost everywhere, in France, 10 times as many, where hostility to Israel in that sector of the populace and also on the radical right and on the radical left is pretty deep, it's pretty hard to stand up for Israel. 
it's hard to even be fair-minded as a politician because you might be committing career suicide. And therefore, the challenges here are really acute. When Israel insistently survives and in the process has to kill people who it doesn't want to kill, it becomes rather tempting to say, you know, I'm either going to become a critic of Israel or I'm just going to shut up. And therefore, it's a hard challenge, that question that you've posed. Hence, why, hence the reason that the people who hate us are pursuing it. Co conventional warfare failed, right? They tried to wipe us out with tanks and planes. We survived. Terrorism, in the conventional term, suicide bombings, amazingly failed. In other words, Israel, for three, four years, from 2000 to 2004, was battered by terrorism. Suicide bombers every week or two, and people did not flee the country, which was the idea. You were meant to be terrorized into going to live somewhere else. So they've now alighted on this combination of rocket attacks on civilian Israel and attempting to demonize us for protecting ourselves. You know, that's a hard challenge. And, you know, if, it, if there was any value in me coming away from re reporting this conflict to speak to you guys for an hour, that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to do it. You're here, you're, you're, you're internalizing aspects of this conflict, and I wanted to be able to, to try and give you some articulate context in which to understand what's going on here so that hopefully when you go back and people say things to you, you'll say, well, actually, that's not true. And really, it's not as simple as the numbers. And don't you understand that Israel has no territorial quarrel with Gaza and there'd be no rockets flying and therefore no Israeli counterattacks if Hamas wasn't firing at Israel, etc., etc. It's very important for me to give you that, those intellectual arguments. So. Those are the incremental ways in which, in which hopefully, you, you marginalize Hamas. More broadly speaking, you know, for Israel to say, the Arab world wants to kill us and therefore we just have to protect ourselves forever, well, lots in the Arab world uh, uh, um, certainly want to kill us. But the solution is not only to protect ourselves, that's an essential part of the solution, but to have people understand the nature of, of the challenges, to have them encourage different religious leadership and different education and different media in Palestinian areas to gradually, perhaps, it'll take a long time, produce a mindset in the Arab world that is less hostile to Israel. These are all challenges that we need to focus on as well, which is a really good place to end. And therefore, I'll take one more question, but it, the challenge to you is it's got to be a really good one. Yeah. And, and still, five of you have your hands up because you're sure it's vital. Okay, I don't know who to choose, so I'll choose you. A lot of pressure on you. Okay, so it is, it is a good question, so you can relax. To what extent are we worried if you, that if we weaken Hamas significantly, even worse people will take over? It's a good question because I think that that was certainly a, de a degree of the conception until the last few days. That for the last few years, we knew Hamas had, was building its own rockets. We knew they were building this underground network. We knew that bad things were waiting. And yet, apparently, we didn't preempt or, or, or choose to enter a conflict among other reasons, perhaps because of the sense that ultimately these were people that you could quote unquote do business with to some extent. I mean, I feel a little silly even saying it given what's happening now, but I think that was part of the, the, the conception. And now I think however brutal organizations like Islamic State and who the hell knows what else might be, Hamas is proving itself spectacularly brutal and cynical. And therefore, I think that concern, ironically, right, is kind of, is kind of evaporated. These guys are, are awful and terrible, and maybe there, there would be even worse around the corner, but what, what we have now is really pretty bad and needs to be confronted. And on that, not encouraging, but you know, I hope this was informative at the very least. And none of you fell asleep, and I know it's been very grueling this trip, so I'm taking that as a, as a sign of, uh, of success here. Enjoy the rest of your trip and go home well equipped to explain to other people what the hell is going on here. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, firstly thank uh, your staff, Linda and James Oppenheim, your business development officer, and at the uh, Jerusalem Press Club, uh, Linda Rifkin, thank you very much, and at the Maynard office, um, uh, all the staff, Susie, Levy, Danny, and uh, uh, Masa Yisrael, uh, Masa Yudish, <laughs> Shmulek, and Arnon, and uh, David, really, thank you very much, really. 
I considered myself a friend of Myra's. I met her uh, by, everything is by accident, by divine providence. I was in Israel and she came uh, with a friend looking for the, ra the rabbi in the neighborhood. And since the rabbi wasn't home, one of the girls was sent to get the rabbi from the synagogue. And I entertained her while he was fetched. We really hit it off. We have the same birthdays a year apart. And um, at that time, my birthday was coming up and she gave her first donation to uh, the Mayanote group in honor of my birthday and I was touched. Nobody ever gave $10,000 in my, in my honor before. We had business off and on and not real business but just friendly, friendliness. I got some Patriot tickets from her one year. We were, I was with the rabbi in Boston and uh, she said to me, I learned the, the meaning of crass at that time. She said, I hope you won't think I'm crass, but are you planning to pay for these tickets? And I said, of course I am. And that's why we were able to be good friends. Uh, we spoke a, a, a little bit off and on, and I was uh, honored to hear Robert use my uh, expression as he was explaining why the tuck rule was working in one of their championship playoff games. I said, um, it had to do with God. Uh, God, God will, God rules, something like that. But he quoted me on air. He didn't quote me, but he quoted the quote. And uh, we still, we do feel that we have, we have a connection with him. And Mara was really a good woman who did a lot of good things in her day. And uh, she's, I can't say she spread herself thin, but she really lived every single one of her years. She lived them fully. And uh, being in the house at the time of Shiva and seeing her big table there and all her, the prospective family members who used to come there, it was really something special that she was a home buddy in, a different, in addition to being a world buddy. Thank you. Thank you.